Thank you. How's everybody doing? Good. So my name is Chris Gorman. I'm a professor in the Department of Chemistry at NC State. I've been doing nanoscience my whole career, even before it was called nanoscience. Uh, but uh, let me give you a sense of what it is in general and uh, how we do it and what it means in terms of the future of discovery, which I think is a very important thing that your students care about. How can they be discoverers? So, let me see if I can get this to work. Right button, okay. So let's define the nanometer scale. Uh, if we start with the sort of length scale that we're used to, and we go down one, two, three, four orders of magnitude, we get down to microorganisms, white blood cells, red blood cells. Um, we're still not at the nanometer scale. We're going to go down one, two, more length scales. And we're going to start to see the double helix of DNA. That's a big molecule, um, a very well-organized molecule. And somewhere in here is the realm of nanoscience. And why do we care about this length scale? Uh, well, there's a lot of interesting phenomena that go on at this length scale uh, that we have yet to fully harness that could be very profitably harnessed. Um, we've already had a talk about nanomedicine. This is a picture to augment it. Um, turns out you can make particles uh, that glow in the dark. Um, the size of the particle determines the color of the particle, and so there's a very simple formula for how to make a particle of a given color. And then there's a bunch of molecules that you can de use to decorate the outside of the particle. It actually, they're there to stabilize the particle, but uh, they're also there to impart function if you want to. So let's put functional groups that like to bind to different kinds of cells, or functional groups that like to bind to just the nucleus of a cell. So if you're a molecular biologist and you need to be able to color code what's going on in your biology, this is a way to do it. Furthermore, those particles can have uh, molecules on their surface which deliver various therapeutic agents as well. And so there's a possibility for therapy here. Nanoparticles, things that are about 100 nanometers, tend to fly under the radar screen of the immune system, more or less. And so that's another uh, advantage to them. OK, in physics, uh, if I took two wires and put a piece of plastic in between them, an insulator, you would expect that no current would flow through that piece of plastic. And that is absolutely true until you get into the realm of the nanoscale when quantum behaviors start appearing. You have a charge on one side of a hill, and then, boom, the charge appears on the other side of the hill. Uh, this quantum teleportation is known as tunneling. And when we do electronics at this length scale, something I'm going to touch on in a minute, we have to take these kinds of behaviors into account. This is a really cool picture right here. What this is, is somebody's arranged a bunch of iron atoms. Each one of those of those little peaks is an image of an iron atom. And that's cool right in of itself, that you could push iron atoms around on a surface uh, and get them into that corral. But look what's going on in the middle. You see these waves? That's the interference of the electrons associated with those atoms. So there's, that's, that's actually an electron interference pattern due to those, those atoms. OK, can we do things that are really functional at the nanometer scale? Actually, not really. We still have a lot to learn. And in fact, my talk is going to dwell on what we have to learn and what we have to do. But here's the existence proof that you can do really complicated things at the nanometer scale. Ribosome is a collection of about 55 proteins. It reads messenger RNA, and it makes other proteins. It is the apparatus that makes organisms run, makes life run. Um, it can make a whole bunch of different proteins. Uh, the proteins themselves have an incredible array of functions. If you want to bind oxygen, you want a protein like hemoglobin. If you want to regulate blood sugar, you want a protein complex like insulin. If you want to 
control the rates of chemical reactions in your body. You do want to do that. Uh, if the rates of chemical reactions in your body start to change even a little bit, you, you, you're done. So uh, proteins, enzymes do that. And these are all very sophisticated jobs that are all being done at the nanometer scale. Now, let's talk about how we might do this. Let's make nanometer stuff. Well, we have a lot to learn, yet we want to learn. We want to be able to make things that are nanometer in size. Let's take computer circuits, for example. Right now, we actually do make them pretty close to 50 nanometers in size. Uh, we want to go smaller. Why do we want to keep going smaller and smaller? Why over the last 50 years have people tried to make, among other things, computer uh, circuits smaller and smaller? Well, because as you make computer elements smaller and smaller, you can put more and more of them on a given amount of real estate. And since they're closer together, they can communicate faster with one another. So I'm sure you're all uh, have uh, been around on the earth long enough to recognize when computers were substantially uh, larger, substantially slower, and substantially more expensive. And this is, this, this shrinking is, is what's uh, given rise to that, that reduction. So, I talked a little bit about the natural world and how functional it is, and I talked a little bit about how we're being challenged in uh, how we're going to do stuff at the nanometer scale. So here's the last thing I'm going to talk about. Basically, if you go to a factory, what we typically do in the factory, what we do when we make computer chips, is we take a hunk of material and whittle down what we want out of it. Contrast that to something where you could take little parts, and if they could click together, you could build up something from the bottom up. This is subtractive. This is additive. This is how we do stuff when in our factories, but prior to our brief existence for several billion years, this is how nature did it, biological manufacturing. And it turns out that top down, Whittling out little features gets harder and harder to do as things get smaller and smaller, but bottom-up manufacturing gets harder and harder to do as things get bigger. And as we're going small, we should consider how bottom-up manufacturing might play a role. Here's a fundamental thing you want to be able to do in bottom-up manufacturing. This is how nature works. This thing I'm showing you here is a picture, is a cartoon of a tobacco mosaic virus. Harmless to us, not so much if you're a tobacco plant. What's remarkable about this thing is that it is composed of exactly 158 copies of a coat protein, and that protein is the same for everyone, and I can write down the molecular formula of that protein. I can account for every atom in that protein, so I can account for every atom in that object. It's a molecule to me from that standpoint. Take it, disrupt it, break all the proteins apart. Then take the disrupting agent away. That'll reconstitute itself as a fully infectious virus particle. Okay? Now, how does that work? Well, within those proteins, there's enough information, there's enough of, of a way that they want to or are inclined to click together so that if you just let them do their thing, they will self-assemble back into an infectious particle, okay? So we need to figure out how to do this if we're going to do manufacturing at the nanometer scale. It just seems to be an inevitable thing. Um, now, I'd love to be able to tell you that we've developed a 55-gallon drum full of a powder that when you pour it in your bathtub and add water, the next morning there's a Ford Explorer waiting for you. I'm going to show you how little we know how to do so far, but here's a way to mix some top-down ideas and some bottom-up ideas and take a first baby step in nano manufacturing. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a pattern 
and we're going to pour a liquid prepolymer on it. A liquid prepolymer is just a, a liquid that cures up, hardens up. You've used two-part epoxy. You've seen in Mission Impossible where they make casts of people's face and impersonate other people. Same idea, okay? That stamp can then be inked with molecules, and these molecules have sulfur atoms at the, at the end of them, and th those sulfur atoms like to stick to gold. And the tails are such that they like to arrange into rows and columns, like, like uh, um, soldiers at a parade. I'm on my last slide. And we can, they'll spontaneously self-assemble across the whole surface, but in combination with the stamp, we can direct them to form patterns at somewhat larger length scales. And now think about starting to build some function into those patterns. Is it sophisticated? No, no, it really isn't, but it's a start. Um, it's something that has been developed over, over some time. Uh, the thing is that when you, and this is, this is the end of my talk, when you get into an area where you don't know how to do very much, there's a lot of opportunities for discovery. In fact, anything you can come up with, even if it's sort of simple, could be sort of a big discovery, a big step forward. And that's the fun of discovery, and that's what we try and do at NC State, and that's what we hope we'll be able to continue to do with the next generations of students that you will send to us. Thank you very much.